we can win if we succeed in lifting the congressional deadline. And I want to just explain very briefly what our argument was in the brief. And I want to commend this brief to you. It's a it's a, just a beautiful document. It's the brief. Here it is. I'll sh show you all. This is the brief we filed in the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia at the appellate stage. It's among the other many amicus briefs that a tremendous number of groups organized in tremendous support of the ratifying states. A, a wonderful amicus effort. But it's one of the proud proudest things I've ever been a part of, working with Catherine and Jessica, we managed to convince a number of the most famous constitutional lawyers in the country, constitutional scholars in the country, to join us. I'll just read the full name. It's the brief of constitutional law scholars Catherine McKinnon, Paul Brest, Rebecca Brown, Kimberly Crenshaw, Martha Field, Lawrence Lessig, Deborah Jones Merritt, Martha Minow, Jessica Newworth, Margaret Jane Radin, Dorothy Roberts, Diane Rosenfeld, Jane Schachter, Jeffrey Stone, Gerald Torres, and Lawrence Tribe as amici in support of reversal. It's a beautiful list of names, highly respected scholars, three, four former deans among them. And what we all join together to say is the states are right. The ERA is, the ratifying states are correct. There is a justiciable question here that a court can decide about whether the ERA is now part of the constitution and the archivist should certify. And a court can decide that because the court regularly decides questions of the balance of power between Congress and the states. It's done so in other federalism or so-called states rights cases, and it can do so here. And we said the text and structure and history of article five of the constitution, which makes amendments very difficult to pass, but doesn't bar their enactment once the uh, super majorities of the Congress and the states come together, uh, the text structure and history of the constitution doesn't make the, the congressional deadline here an obstacle to ratification. Why not? Well, the text of article five doesn't speak about time limits, how long you have to ratify an amendment that's been proposed by Congress. The framers knew how to put time limits in the constitution when they wanted to. The president only has 10 days to pocket veto a law that comes from Congress. If they wanted to put a 10 days or 10 years requirement into Article 5, they could have, they didn't. We also said the structure of the Constitution means that the congressional deadline can't preclude ratification now because Article 5 is the only part of the Constitution that gives literally co-equal power between the Congress and the states. Neither has a veto over the other. And therefore, to read the congressional deadline as a veto over the states would unbalance the balance set by Article 5. And we said there's no history for this. The, the, the deadline was in the preamble. It wasn't in the text. Back in early earlier in the 20th century, the Congress would sometimes put a deadline in the text of the amendment. And so the states got to vote on an amendment with a deadline in it. But the states only vote on the content of the ERA. They didn't vote on the deadline in the preamble. So we said nothing in the history of prior amendments would preclude ignoring that preamble now, or not ignoring it, seeing it as Congress's best advice to the states to speed it up. You know, we want you to act quickly, but Congress can urge the states or exhort the states to act quickly without creating an enforceable binding deadline that a court would enable, would enable a court to say, I'm sorry, this is too late. So that was our first argument, the text structure and history of the amendment clause of the constitution does not preclude the archivist from ratifying now, even though the three most recent ratifying states ratified after the deadline. Second big part of our argument is we said, there's no implied requirement in the constitution that an amendment be ratified within a reasonable time of when Congress proposed it. There are a lot of folks out there who say, well, there's an implied contemporaneity requirement in the constitution. It must be contemporaneous that the states, the peoples of the states agree with the people in the Congress about passing an amendment. Um, we have a very obvious help to us in that department because the 27th amendment, which was proposed by the first Congress in 1789, was not ratified by three quarters of the states until 203 years later, when somebody dusted it off and rolled it out again and got the last states to ratify. And the 27th Amendment became part of the Constitution without anybody saying, well, the peoples of the states were too far removed from James Madison and the founders 
to have been able to pass the 27th Amendment, which is a restriction on uh, congressional expenditures. So we have the 27th Amendment as sort of exhibit A, that there's no requirement of reasonable time period in the Constitution. And then we had a number of technical arguments about why prior statements and Supreme Court opinions to the contrary didn't bar us. And then the third part of our argument was, this doesn't mean that rescissions are okay. So there's nothing in the text of the Constitution that authorizes states to rescind. Article five speaks only of ratification, not rescission. And we're not suggesting that uh, by this set of arguments that there's any validity to states rolling things back. And we talked a little bit about how no rescission has ever been recognized. You know, there were attempts to rescind the civil rights amendments after the Civil War and no rescission efforts have ever been recognized. So those were the three parts of the argument. Archivist should certify because Article Five says text, structure, and history support that the ERA is now the law of the land. It has been ratified. It should be in the Constitution. Second argument, you don't need to have ratified within some reasonable time limit of the proposal. And third argument, this doesn't mean rescissions are OK. But I want to just tell you the last part of our brief that I think makes it so unique among all the briefs and so powerful, especially when spoken in the voice of the collection of all-star brilliant constitutional scholars who joined it. We said, and this is the last point I'll make, and then we can open it up to questions. We said in our brief, nothing in our argument should be construed to in any way undermine Congress's pending joint resolutions to lift the deadline. Uh, we said that there's, there's nothing inconsistent with having two ways for the ERA to become the legitimate law of the land. A court can declare it, or if Congress now lifts the deadline, which we think would be potentially unreviewable by a court, then that would moot this case and also make the ERA law. We wrote nothing in Amiki's, the Amiki Curiae, nothing in Amiki's arguments here should be construed to question Congress's power to follow this alternative path to recognizing the ERA as a valid part of our constitution. Now, why was that so important to this brief? And why was it so important that this group of constitutional scholars said that? Well, the, the reason is that because there are other constitutional scholars, also distinguished and well-recognized people, who said the courts uh, should have nothing to do with this because it should all be up to Congress. We disagreed that our group of scholars believe that we sometimes achieve very important change through the courts and that you shouldn't just assume the political process will always be the place to help. You shouldn't just assume that Congress is always a better audience for you than the courts. I think back to you know, the role of you know, Justice Kennedy and a majority of the court in advancing a series of gay rights cases from Romer versus Evans to Lawrence versus Texas to Windsor and Obergefell. That was, that, that was happening in the courts at a time when Congress was lagging and we had to live through an era of don't ask, don't tell and the Defense of Marriage Act coming out of our political bodies. So I think this group of constitutional scholars represents a view from my generation and I'm not sure how common it is in the newer generation that courts are very legitimate places to vindicate important progressive causes and that one should try wherever there's a good constitutional argument that something can be justiciable in the courts, go to court. At the same time, of course, Congress has important power. It, Congress and the states are the only folks who are named in the constitution here. Uh, the archivist isn't mentioned, the executive branch isn't mentioned. And, in, and, and of course, Congress has an important role. And our view is that Congress is free to specify a desired time period for ratification and to extend or lift that deadline, so long as the deadline is not incorporated in the text of the amendment that is sent to the states. But such deadlines are best understood as advisory rather than binding on the states or judicially enforceable. So I don't know if Catherine and Jessica will mind me saying this, but I think our brief tried to have the best of both worlds. We tried mm -hmm. to show why a congressional action here would be constitutionally valid supportable and is essentially final in this case. If Carol and Bettina and everyone on this call succeeds in bringing it about. But we also tried to argue that the states deserve to win in court. And if they do, that's also final. 